Section 11.11 .11 is fairly interesting, and I wanted to just touch on it briefly and point it out to you. I would recommend checking it out with a little bit more detail. But in this particular section, they lay out the thermodynamics of a car battery. And the car battery's reactants, we will cover a little bit more in the next slide, but its ingredients are lead oxide, sulfuric acid, and solid lead. So obviously a lot of really nasty stuff in a car battery. And it's a little bit hard to imagine this, but they actually make a reversible Carnot engine out of the thermodynamics and the heat released by this reaction, because it is an exothermic reaction. And then they compare that to how much electrical work is capable of being done. So let's first write down the electrical work. And that is, of course, just equal to the negative delta G of this reaction which we could calculate using the methods in this chapter. We've already seen how to calculate the delta G of the reaction. And then if we compare that to the amount of thermal work that's capable of being done, maybe you remember from an earlier chapter that this is equal to the temperature of the hot reservoir times the efficiency of the engine. And this section of the chapter lays out that this happens to equal delta H and then the hot temperature reservoir, the cold temperature reservoir, all over temperature of the hot reservoir, like that. Now if we use T hot and T cold for a car engine, T hot is gonna be about 600 Kelvin and T cold is gonna be about 300 Kelvin. And what's very cool about this section is they make a fraction between the amount of electrical work that this reaction can do versus the amount of thermal work that can be done with a Carnot engine. And it is more than three times higher if you use the electrical uh, form of work than the thermal form of work. So that just goes to show how much more useful work can be done by using batteries than thermal engines. So you may ask, why haven't we done this from the beginning and why are we still not doing it? How come we're still using thermal engines and we're not just using batteries? The answer is that they haven't, the, the, the technology that's used to make batteries that are capable of driving cars has only very recently been developed. And in addition to that, for the last hundred years, we've had an abundance of very high energy fuel that can be used in thermal engines that's fairly cheap and that r really does hold a tremendous amount of energy in a very condensed form. And that is, of course, gasoline and petroleum products and such. But the good news is that the battery technology is advancing and we are starting to be able to make Teslas and hybrid cars and cars that are able to utilize this very highly efficient form of electrical work. All right, on this final slide, I wanna take a look at some of the chemical reactions that are occurring within common household batteries, cause it's uh, good to know that sort of thing. First off, I just wanna make a comment on this very interesting figure that I have here on the right. When I first saw this picture, it blew my mind. Because I had no idea that inside these 9-volt cells, there are just six little AAA batteries all wired up and their voltages are being combined. If you were to cut open a 9-volt battery, not that I recommend doing that, but that's what you would find. <laughs> so, I don't know, I thought that was kind of cool. Now, the battery that you're probably most familiar with are the so-called alkaline batteries. And that's because they are typically performing a reaction of the sort listed down here. Manganese oxide, a highly alkaline substance, and then it's reacting with metallic zinc in order to form zinc oxide and uh, the reduced form of manganese oxide. Manganese 3 oxide, I suppose. And uh, that's not necessarily the only reaction that's occurring here. I found a number of other batteries in my drawer and I'm taking a look at them. This one looks like it's manganese, and I'm 
Taking a look at another one here, this is a AAA non-rechargeable battery, carbon zinc. So there's obviously some other kind of reaction that's occurring there. Another battery that you're probably highly familiar with, if you've ever had, if you've ever <laughs> had to have AAA come and jump your battery for you, or if you've ever had to have someone else help you out with a battery jump, is the car battery. And this is the reaction that is occurring in the car battery. That's also the one we were considering on the last slide. As you can see, it's solid lead reacting with lead oxide in the presence of sulfuric acid, and it's forming lead sulfate and water. And uh, this is a reaction that has been in car batteries for almost the span of a century. It's just uh, so effective for that particular purpose. Next, nickel cadmium rechargeable batteries. I have some power tools down in my garage that use this particular reaction. The batteries are no longer even rechargeable because even if you have a rechargeable battery, there's only a certain number of times they can recharge and they are quite old. I inherited them from my grandfather, but this is the reaction that is occurring in those. Those are sort of the more old fashioned style rechargeable batteries, nickel cadmium. Boy, uh, just like the car battery, you've got a toxic heavy metal in that cadmium. So you don't definitely don't want to cut open that type of battery and mess with the contents. The uh, toxic heavy metal uh, will definitely <laughs> not agree with you. Uh, we've also got some uh, lithium ion batteries that you would probably have in your cell phone or your laptop. This is a bit more of a recent technology, but it's uh, it maybe... A reaction of this sort. You can find other kinds of reactions in your book as well. So here I've got uh, some other kinds of batteries. This one is mercury cadmium. Oh my gosh, like uh, this is one that I found in my drawer and it's like, wow, that's <laughs> that's definitely not one that I want to cut open. Gosh, both mercury and cadmium. Let's see, I've got one here that is nickel cadmium. Okay, uh, so that's that that third item I was just showing you there. Um, so anyway, clearly you get the idea. Uh, it might be interesting to see what all kinds of batteries you're able to discover in your own parents' drawer or something like that. Anyway, this concludes our chapter 11 lectures, and this actually concludes the thermodynamics portion of the course. So give yourself a nice pat on the back and a nice round of applause. You've completed thermodynamics. At this point, you would be all set and ready to take the ACS exam for thermo. And uh, then from here, we would just move on to uh, stat mech and kinetics. And that is indeed what we will do. So congratulations, everyone. And I look forward to seeing you all in Chapter 16 after Easter break. Well done.